Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hello, friends. Welcome to Mavs Moneyball After Dark. It's 11-11 exactly as the Dallas Mavericks somehow just defeated the Utah Jazz 126-118 to on the road. It was their first win in Utah out of the previous uh, – they lost 11 straight. I don't know how we phrased that. And they came away with a win without Luka Doncic playing – Just superb basketball in a game that required a lot of resiliency and had a lot of dips and dives. And holy cow, Josh, how are you doing? I'm good. Kirk, what if I told you that the Utah Jazz shot 56.5% from the floor? They shot 31 of 33 from the free throw line. That's 94% on 33 attempts. And they lost by eight at home to a Mavericks team without Luka Doncic. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like, I'm looking at the Mav stats, and the Mav stats are good. (laughs) But they're not great. They're good. It's the threes. Look at the threes. So 43%, 18 to 42. Doubled them. That's the Doubled them up on makes. Oh, my God. And the Jazz only took 28. They they still haven't. I mean, they averaged like 42 in the regular season, 42 a game. Man. I mean, the game plan is working. They just keep executing. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, just, I think overall, you know, I'll probably, I think this is what I'm going to write about later, you know, after we get off with this and for tonight or tomorrow morning, the Mavericks just have all the answers. I mean, there's, I don't know what the jazz can do tactically in this series anymore. And it really like this game just kind of proved to me that the Mavericks have the strategic advantage in this series. And it just comes down to, can they execute and can they take advantage of that advantage? I mean, that's a terrible phrase, but you know, if if, that's what it feels like, like, I I don't, I don't know what else the jazz can do because it's only going to get worse because Luka Doncic is likely coming back in game four. So I've been impressed with the Mavericks execution and game plan on both sides of the ball. And, but I've also been flabbergasted, you know, just as someone who's not watched the jazz very closely uh, as, you know, a team blogger would, or, or a local jazz media would just flabbergasted at how rudderless this jazz roster is. Uh, it's just been an amazing combination to see in these three games. And, I mean, they threw the kitchen sink at Dallas tonight. I mean, <laughs> let's let's kind of just walk through it. So the Mavericks beat the shit out of them in the first half. To they the did. point to where Royce O'Neal, random, you know, ma- ra- random starter, 32 minute guy, kind of, you know, he's he's like their he's kind of a glue guy for him. When games where he's he's big, they tend to play well. Um, really just started hunting Jalen Brunson in a way that I think is gonna I'm gonna be interested to see if he if he gets a fine or something because he threw Brunson to the ground repeatedly. And in the middle of the second quarter, 
he threw an elbow and a cheap shot to Brunson that put Brunson on the ground for about 30 seconds. Oddly, Jason Kidd did not call a timeout, let Brunson hobble around. I don't know what he was doing there. That was that was curious. Uh, Brunson, if you want to, not to interrupt you, but apparently he did not see that. Like, I think he was like talking to a coach or something. For so a minute, it was like a minute. It was a possession and then something else. Like he was calling you out of the game. It was weird. Anyways, yeah. that, that is what it is. And then um, kid, uh, like they got him out of the game and then things were feeling bleak just because like, I think the jazz either cut it to nine or 11 because the Mavericks were up by 16 or 18 at that point. And then like <laughs> the bench, the bench unit, like the Josh Green Davis Berton superhero combo, yeah, came through with just some ballsy play down the stretch, and the Mavericks entered halftime up sixty-eight to fifty-one. And why don't you tell tell the good folks what happened in the the third quarter, and then we can talk about the fourth quarter. Yeah, in the third quarter, it was we kind of started to see the Jazz. So the Mavericks were in foul trouble for most of the night and it caught up to them in the third quarter because Maxi got his fifth foul pretty early in the third quarter. And so what happened in the third quarter, the the Jazz did, there's two things. One, Maxi got his fifth foul, so he had to sit for a lot of the third quarter. And two, they sat Gobert and they played, uh, who they play? Eric Pascal, uh, Pascal at center, who hasn't played in a playoff game before until he played 10 minutes tonight, all of them in the second half. Um, so they went small ball. I mean, we were kind of waiting for that. That was like their last card to play was to do five out and match the Mavericks five out lineups. So it was a combination of that and Maxine on the floor. So Bertans was on the floor uh, because I think Dwight Powell was also in foul trouble as well. Yeah, he had five fouls. Yep. He finished the game with five fouls. So they didn't, you know, they didn't really have anyone else. They didn't want, you know, they, I guess they didn't want to do Josh Green small ball center. So they went with Bertans who had a pretty, you know, like you said, a pretty good first half. So what happened in the third was with the combination of the Jazz going small and the Mavericks having Kleba or Powell on the floor, it meant that their defensive game plan kind of sh- didn't work the way it needed to. So the Mavericks were still running the Jazz off the three-point line in the third quarter. The problem was without Maxi and without you know a, a rim protector, those 10 to 12 footers that the Jazz were shooting in games one and two in the first half of this game were turning into layups and dunks because the Mavericks couldn't contain you know couldn't contain the rim as well without maxi or dwight uh on the floor so that was tr- you know that was trouble that got the jazz back into the game and it made things closer than it probably needed to be you know if maxi could have avoided foul trouble they might have been able to weather that storm a bit better but yeah that's kind of how it broke down and it made the fourth quarter uh, a bit more tense than i think we thought it, it would have been yeah, and it's one of those one of those things where I'm I'm left pondering whether the Jazz have found something. And I think we should circle back to that in the end, but that's sort of what happened there in the third. And then in the fourth, things just got tight. And I mean, the Jazz kept coming. They inserted Rudy Gobert. I don't remember who hit the three, but they got to 103-102. And then uh, Spencer Dimwitty, who had essentially been a pumpkin all game, oh, scored... Man scored two straight layups with Rudy Gobert there who had Rudy Gobert had basically been his, his like personal demon for three games. And it like that, that forced the jazz to call a timeout up one Oh seven. The, the Mavs were up one Oh seven, one Oh two Brunson then responded basically on a six, two run all by himself. And at that point, the game felt over. Um, it was one thirteen to one Oh four and the Mavericks just needed to hold on. And the jazz kept coming uh, Dorian Finney Smith connected on a huge three. Dinwiddie hit the most bullshit three he has hit this year. Even the Nets one wasn't like this because he was like fumbling with the ball when he rose up on an end of a shot clock thing to put the Mavericks back up either by 10 or by nine. And the Jazz just didn't have enough. Like it was weird watching the Jazz think that they were okay, like that they were going to do this. And it just never materialized. And the Mavericks walked away. Yeah. And uh, those. Back to back Dinwiddie buckets. We can't say enough how crucial those two were, those two buckets were, and also how awful he had been playing up until he made those two buckets. Um, there were stretches in the fourth quarter there and in the third quarter where they were playing without Brunson when Brunson was trying to get a, br- uh, a breather. And Dinwiddie had, oh, I don't know how many possessions, three or four possessions, maybe five where the Mavericks were screening the Jazz's worst defender onto him, whether it was Jordan Clarkson, Mike Conley, or Donovan Mitchell. And they would get one of those guys on on Dinwiddie, spread out, let him go to work. And that's what 
has been winning the Mavericks this series, at least on the offensive side of the ball, just the way they've demolished the Maverick, the, the Jazz's awful perimeter defenders. And I think in those possessions, uh, the only thing the Mavericks came away from were like two Dinwiddie free throws. And the, like it was it was brutal watching him like seemingly be the only guard or player on the floor that couldn't get by Donovan Mitchell or, or score against Jordan Clarkson. Like it was, it was rough. Like the Mavericks needed him to come through in those possessions while Brunson was on the bench and he just didn't. And then of course, you know, he scores two of the most important buckets of the game right back to back when, when, when the crowd is on top of them and, and they're about to blow the lead. So who knows, maybe we reverse jinxed him. Like I'm glad he came through with those buckets and then he had a really nice assist to Finney Smith, but man, it was, it was looking bleak for him, uh, up, you know, before that. And I'm glad because I had actually pre-written a <laughs> section of my recap just because, I mean, up until there was a point before I'm just looking at stats here because he finished 6 of 4. No, where is he? He finished 6 of 21. At one point, he was 3 of 16. Yep. So he he hit three of his last five shots, and two of them were three-pointers. So... That like his stat line actually looks pretty good. 20 points, six, yeah, six, yeah. five rebounds. And anybody who watched the game was screaming at him because he just made some bumbling weird choices. Yeah. Um the one thing I'll say for him and his defense, you know, despite you know, outside of the those two clutch buckets and the three, which are obviously huge, I think his playmaking and passing was pretty steady from opening tip to the end of the game. You know, I'll give him that, you know, six assists, two turnovers in Salt Lake City, like that's that's great like you know can't knock him there it was just he just had this weird stubborn want to to get to the rim and it you know it's it's admirable how badly he wants to get to the rim but there were just so many opportunities where he just made it harder on himself because he just so desperately wanted to score at the rim and got a little tunnel tunnel vision and and could have maybe done something else but I, I will say this you know six assists two turnovers uh in Salt Lake Yep. He'll take that from your point guard. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, he's got to get on track, is what it was. Yeah, he so. just yeah, and it's just weird because he what he was fifty percent or he's like fifty two percent on mid rangers in Dallas. Obviously, that's like an unsustainable number, and he was forty eight percent on pull up two pointers. And it's like, okay, well, what better team to use that against than the Utah Jazz who play drop? And he's just not taking those shots. He's just. He's going to the rim, and, and I admire it. And he got seven free throw attempts. He made two clutch buckets. But, man, he just – it seemed like he would go to the rim without a plan, and he'd get there and well, it, well, like he was to at, do. So it's like he was going to the rim anticipating something, and then, like, that something materialized when he – before he – it's like there was no decisiveness. And Dinwiddie, the decisive player, is – but anybody that plays tentative against a, a defender like Gobert is just going to get eaten up. Plain and simple. Um, but that's that, and it worked out. And, you know, I, I think we're kind of underplaying the Brunson aspect of this just because there's so much to talk about. But Brunson coming back from the injury, like, it did not look good. Like, it looked like a hip pointer or something oh, in his man. lower back. Like, anybody I, I, that's – go yeah, ahead. You go ahead. Cause, no, you go ahead because you've had – you could personally kind of speak well, to it, I mean, anybody that's probably over the age of 25 has done something <laughs> stupid to their back. Where it's just like you either, you know, you fall down drunk or you're like lifting something in your house or you sleep funny and you wake up and you're like, God, that hurts. And when your back hurts or your core hurts, everything hurts. And, and you know, whatever they did, they rubbed something on him and he was back to hit himself. I mean, he didn't hit many threes tonight. Let me see here. What did he have? Um, he didn't hit any threes, but he was like, the, the free throws look good. The shooting motion was good. And just him coming back really settled the Mavericks down. They couldn't have been, they couldn't have done it without him. And, it, you know, 96 points through three starts uh, in his playoff series. Like it, it, he's been out outstanding. And I'm really pleased. Like one of the things I was um, talking about this, there's a guy who I used to, who I used to DM with all the time, um, Tyler, who he, I would just, hate, I mean, I hated Brunson for like two years. Like, it, like there's receipts, these things exist. Um, and, and yeah, he was, just, he's, he's, he was your first. Scorn. Yeah. Because I, because I didn't understand. And I was wrong about this. I didn't understand that he had a role and was sticking to the role. And his role was to go score the basketball, not run the offense. 
And Kidd has given him the keys to run the offense. And since doing that, it's made him much, much harder to defend than he was under Carlisle. He's also improved as a player, but like the, this is a two time national player of the year. Like he's a, this is, it's not like he needed that much. And he's do, like, he, we were talking about him from the very beginning of the season. He's the only guy that we really liked when the Mavs were absolutely in the mud. So for him to just follow through with this kind of performance is unreal. He is going to get paid and I, I am really happy for him and happy for the Mavericks that they have to spend all that money to keep him. And I'm pretty, I'm hopeful they're going to keep him, but I just want to talk about Brunson for a second because there's so many wild things that happen that I wouldn't, yeah. I didn't want to, it felt like something we could overplay, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we probably need to talk about Brunson for multiple seconds. Just, I mean, what is it? So, so games two and three, 72 points. One turnover, one turnover, one turnover in two games where he's basically Luca like a fit usage rate. Like, mo- maybe the most unbelievable stat I've seen, uh, from a Mavericks player in some time. And I, and like <laughs> the scoring is incredible, the shooting is incredible. I cannot get over one turnover in these in games two and three combined. That is that is outrageous. I cannot believe that. Um, like just a testament to him. Like I, all all the praise, you know, all the accolades. Anything you want to say about him? I mean, it's not enough uh, with that. I just, it's unbelievable. I mean, I just don't know how to describe it. I don't think I've ever. I mean, there's got to be some some good, uh, you know, stat researchers. You know, I know Tim McMahon. You know, uh, gets some some ESPN. You know, their stats bureau their department that looks up some really wild numbers. Like, there's got to be some crazy historical things going on here with with luca uh brunson's turnover numbers i just it's outstanding uh and it's a huge reason why they're up two one i am i mean i'm just i'm tickled to death because i wrote about the game and when i write about the game it forces me to focus a little more and i don't freak out about shit (laughs) but i had a hard time with this game and yeah you were you were you were oddly tilted this game i felt well because the 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 Dinwiddie, the Dinwiddie tentativeness <laughs> drives me crazy. And so for him to come back through out of it is really important to me. I didn't write about that because I didn't want to go off the deep end. But they, like, a decent Spencer Dinwiddie game and they win the game. And what do you know? He had a decent game. Like, he has too many opportunities. But anyways, like, when you look at what this coaching staff did for moments to steal time, I'm really kind of in awe. Um at one point in the second quarter, they rolled out a lineup of Spencer Dinwiddie, uh, Dorian Finney-Smith, Josh Green, Trey Burke, and Davis Bertans. And not only did they roll out that lineup, that lineup increased the lead. And it was like four <laughs> minutes of needed time because let me just throw some minute totals at you again. Dorian Finney-Smith played 47 minutes. Reggie Bullock played 44 minutes. Brunson only 35 partially because he was hurt, but yeah, they kept Dinwiddie. He go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry. I was just going to say only because he was hurt. He would have played yeah. 42, but they would have kept like, he basically missed four, four to five minutes of action. So he would have played 40, but like they didn't they, just getting those minutes, those stolen minutes, which then turned into like massively positive minutes is so freaking important. And to get it on the road, I am, I am just shocked. Yeah. Because, right. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, when Brunson gets hurt, you just sort of think the wheels are going to come off and the coaching, like the confidence comes from the coaching staff. Like Carl was a hell of a coach, but Carl did not inspire anyone at that point. By the time he left, like, that's just a fact because Luca wanted to kick him in the nads. And you know, you remember when he slapped the chair, when they, when he called that timeout badly yeah. against the, the Clippers in game, in game three. three. Yep, yeah. Like that. that was the turning point. Luca was right. Carl was wrong. And kid you know gathers the troops for a minute and they go back out there and they retake the lead and then extend it to 17 i just you know some of that's maverick shot making right you 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 credit the players for that but that the players have the confidence to go do that is really fucking cool yeah i mean what did we say after game one we were like they cannot sustain not having zero bench production and games two game two obviously had the maxi uh awakening and then tonight they had three guys at least score 12. Maxi 17, Bertans 15, Josh Green 12. Josh Green 12 and six assists. Um it was it was outstanding. And I hope that settles him. 
Yeah, I, I, yes, for sure. He looked much more comfortable than he did in the first two games. For Tons in particular, I was very tickled to see him get seven three point attempts in fourteen minutes because he had played. He's been averaging about you know twelve to fifteen minutes a game so far this series, and we've been like, man, why isn't he shooting? Like, why aren't they? You know, if he's going to be on the floor, they need to run some sets. Don't just let him stand there and spot up. And I feel like they finally kind of did that a little bit, uh, and they got him more involved. They got him moving around. And then just the fact that the Mavericks have kind of totally figured out this Jazz defense has meant that they just get open threes whenever they want, I guess, because the Jazz just have turnstiles at the point of attack, and they over-rotate, and Bertans finally got free. He hit two in the corner. He had a four-point play. Um, it, it was awesome. Um, and it was just great to see, you know, those guys just kind of make do. I mean, they were. It looked like those that lineup was going to run away with the game. And in games one and two, you know, before that, we we're like, man, can they just like hold water? And it's just that that turnaround is crazy. Um, I believe some people pointed it out online. Uh, I can't remember who the first person who who talked about it was, but you posted in our Slack talking about how Green was kind of used as uh, a fulcrum for dribble handoffs. Mm-hmm. Might have been our friend uh, Reese who writes for. Uh, Dallas, Dallas Fanatic. Fanatics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think he might have been the one who, who called that, which was a really good observation. And, you know, it's a way, like, if they're not going to guard you using green, you know, using green as uh, in the corner, if they're not going to guard, like, it's just it's just kind of a waste of his time. If, if the Jazz are just going to abandon him so much, use him as a screener, you know, get him moving around the floor to cause the Jazz defense to react because, you know, that's how you get things going on the offensive end is causing a defense to react. And when, you know, you're just planting Josh green in the corner and he's not being guarded and he's, he's lifting up some, some awful looking jumpers, like that's not serving anybody. So that was a really nice adjustment from the Mavericks coaching staff. (sighs) And for green, you just got to feel good for him because he was down bad. Um, His last game was bad and bad to the point where he played 30 seconds, the second half and they yanked him because he was so bad. And I really, it's just, you know, I think people misunderstand criticism when it's like, when I say I don't think he's good enough, it's not his fault. He's being put in a position when he hasn't yet developed the skills and had the experience. Like even the regular season, I think we talked about how we don't think Green played enough. Like there were games where Green would get like seven minutes when he should have gotten 12. So the fact that they had to go to them and then he delivered is wildly important. Now there's a play. I I sort of want you to look for this at some point if you get the opportunity. There's this weird thing, and it was either Dinwiddie or Brunson at the top of the key, and um, Bullock runs down to the left of him and is like, you know, kind of fake calling for the ball, and Spencer waves him through, and Davis Bertans is in the far corner. And so um, Burke, or I'm sorry, Bullock runs through to the corner, and Davis kind of slides up, and then both him and Bull, uh, uh, Bullock sort of fake like they're coming in, like he's going to drive and they're going to get an offensive board. And Berton sets a screen and Bullock flares out to the corner and gets a wide open shot that he buries. Some of the looks that the Mavericks are getting are stuff I haven't seen all year. And it's great. Yeah. Uh, their ex- their execute, like I said, their execution is, I mean, perfect. I mean, I, I, it's hard to complain. There were, I mean, seeing some of those possessions like that are, are really fun. Uh, seeing the way they're using Bullock is kind of like, I know he's not getting a ton of attempts, but the way they kind of move him around the floor in this series is kind of like Tim Hardaway Jr. light in terms of like, they desperately need like a, a, a guy that can move and shoot like, uh, you know, coming off screens that can attract the defense. And I think they're kind of using Bullock like that. And obviously not to like the same degree they would use like a Tim or, or even Bertans, but it's something and it, and it helps a lot with the starting group. Uh, and especially when Bullock's is locked in as he in, as he is. Um, and then, you know, there were some, some possessions, I think in the third or fourth where there was some like really weird spacing. I noticed, you know, Dinwiddie driving in when Maxi was like, you know, kind of that weird stuff we see some guy cutting to the basket when a guy's driving and then bringing more defenders in. But at that point it was like the fourth quarter and like these guys are tired. Um, so, so I, I kind of understood it, but thankfully they were able to get around that. But yeah, the, the execution has been sublime. So far. I, it, <sighs> I just, I don't even know where to go with this game. Like I'm, 
I'm elated, but I'm all like, it's like coming. It was, I just kept expecting things to go to hell and the Mavericks held off. And not only have they held off, I think we should close with this. They held off. They're up two one and Mark Stein have had basically, I mean, he reported that the Mavericks expect Luka Doncic to come back for game four. Game four is Saturday at three 30 central time. Um, it's kind of like a day and a half after this one. So it makes sense why the Mavericks held him out again. Mm-hmm. And this is the, this is the time. Um, the Mavericks have a real chance. Like they retook home court. And mm-hmm. even if they lose game four, which I don't know if they will, but now the, the jazz and Matt Moore and I did a really excellent podcast that I, I hope you've taken the time to listen to, um, where he explains, cause he did a huge video like dive on this and he was very into the Mavericks winning this series, um, explains why, like both when Luca can come eventually came back, like what that will do to what the jazz want to do, because if Luca comes back, it changes their game plan and philosophy entirely. There's an argument to be made that the Jazz could score easier with Luka on the floor, but with the shots that they've been getting with Jalen Brunson, what do we think is going to happen with Luka Doncic? Like, <laughs> woo! Everybody ought to be excited. Is my yeah, opinion. it's going to be pretty. It's going to be wild. And the thing that I just can't get over, and I'm just sitting here thinking it through, and I don't. What does Utah do tactically or strategically here? Like. I don't I can't remember the last time the Mavericks were in a playoff series where they were this so far ahead at, at tactics wise uh, against the team. Like it re- it really does feel like the Jazz just are hoping like hey maybe Brunson just misses some of those shots. Like you know maybe Maxi misses some open th- like it doesn't feel like they have an answer because I mean their starting lineup, their starting backcourt is Mitchell and Conley and those guys can't stay in front of anyone. Their only defender worth a damn that's on the perimeter that's not Gobert is Royce O'Neal, and he's preferably like a guy that guards bigger wings. Like I don't think they necessarily want him on Jalen Brunson, but they have no choice. The only guy on their bench that can really do it is Daniel House, but he played 19 minutes and scored two points. Um, so like I don't I don't know where they go from here. Like I thought a big adjustment was like, are they going to give Jordan Clarkson some bigger minutes? And they did, and he scored 14 points in 30 minutes, but. Yep. They, they still lost. Like, I mean, they, they went small, you know, they play, you know, it wasn't just in the third quarter. They went small. I mean, they pulled Gobert with like six, five or six minutes left, like in legitimate crunch time, they tried it again. Uh, and it still couldn't really claw them, you know, over the top uh, and get them back into this game. So I don't know. Like, there's not like a well, guy on their bench. Have that, you been following the timeline? Like some of the post game quotes. Yeah, the freaking Mitchell quote this is, about Pascal is it's absurd. I mean, Donovan Mitchell is a – I am delighted I don't have to root for him. He I is an extremely upsetting player. Yeah, I just – I'm astounded at the lack of defense. Like, his defense is just – I mean, it's like worse than Luka rookie year. And, I mean, I, I just don't – I don't get it. Like he's not that old. He's obviously like, I mean, he's an explosive athlete, so it's not like uh, he's not physically up to it. And the weird thing is it's not like he's like this aloof off ball defender that can't play like a, you know, team scheme. Like this is a dude that is just staring at his man Mm -hmm. dripping in front of him and just letting them go by. Like, it's I haven't seen something like this in a while like it'd be one thing if he was just like this guy that gets lost on screens or or just can't he doesn't want contact ball. yeah he, just, he does not like defensive contact he can't and he's a big anyone. fucking baby when he drives the lane he acts like he gets shot he's you know he took Dwayne Wade's 2006 advice only like everything else he does he executes it half-assed and terribly, he falls in the ground and does push-ups after he's mean mugging. If you're going to pull that shit, you got to play on both sides of the floor. Like, I, I, I've not disliked a player like I dislike Donovan Mitchell <laughs> since Dwayne Wade. But the problem is, he's not that good. Dwayne Wade is one of the best defensive guards of all time. <laughs> yeah, Dwayne Wade was like an all-defensive capable guard. Uh, this is just laughable. I just... I mean, the Mavericks game plan is literally just who's who's guarding Donovan Mitchell. Okay, that guy's screen for Brunson or Didwitty, and there we go. 
And the Mavericks have done this for three games now, and the Jazz haven't really done much to stop it. Because I feel like in game one, while we were so heated about Brunson's performance in game one, is because I think you and I both agree it wasn't necessarily what the Jazz were doing. We just felt like Brunson was just missing the look, like he was missing his good his shots. Like if it was more felt like it was more on Brunson. And this is why. Like, I mean, there's just there's nothing. There's no resistance. And the Maverick shot, you know, 49% from the floor overall. I mean, they didn't shoot as good from two, I think, as they have at last game. So, like, the Mavericks kind of maybe left a little meat on the bone there. I mean, Brunson was obviously good, 12 of 22. Um, but, you know, Dinwiddie, again, 6 of 21, despite the fact that he, you know, was matched up on on, on Mitchell a couple times. So, like, I mean, there's still, like, I'm, imagine you take Dinwiddie and you put him back to the bench. Imagine what Luka Doncic is going to do when Donovan Mitchell gets switched on to him. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a bloodbath. Mm-hmm. It's going to be not pretty. Man, I don't even know. <laughs> Josh, we've been talking. We should probably yeah. stop talking because we yeah. can just ramble about this series. This is great. We're in a great yeah. spot. I'm happy. I hope yeah. everybody's having a good time. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Uh, Absolutely. I will say this is probably like the most, you know, I think you know me long enough and you know that I've been doing this for a while and my background, you know, trying to do this for real, like as a real job that has kind of sapped some of the the fandom from me compared to where I was 10 or 15 years ago. And I got to admit, this was the game that got me kind of fired up. Like uh, that Royce O'Neal cheap shot really pissed me off. And to see Brunson come back and put the team, put the jazz away in the fourth quarter, like I I was feeling like high school, college age Josh again, just kind of like mm-hmm. getting excited, getting into the game. Like this was this was a real this was a fun one. I, I really enjoyed this one. Yeah, Whew. we get another one Saturday, three thirty. Do it again, and I'll be back. Um, God, I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna record a green room after this. It's not midnight or anything. I don't know, <laughs> whatever. This is what we do this for. We have a great time with it. Guys, yeah. been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow. If you haven't checked out Mads Moneyball for some reason or another. Our staff has been putting out absolute amazing work day after day in volume too. Not like one to two articles. Part of what, like we, we try not to write too much in season because it's just, it's a lot of work. And the staff has basically been coming through with incredible work, different angles, really love it. You know, Josh wrote the defining defensive piece on, on the Mavericks defensive game plan. You know, there was, there was a couple of other things floating around about it, but Josh wrote it first and wrote it better. Um, to come to our site, you know, there's a lot of great content out there, but I really am proud of what we're doing and I hope you give us a chance guys. It's been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow. Please subscribe, uh, review, do all that wonderful stuff. And we will talk to you soon.